All right, so Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. It's interesting this week, speaking of Daniel chapter 5, and, you know, there's things in life that just shouldn't happen. And, one, you know, one of those things is going to be in Daniel chapter 5 here. But I found another one in the news that was getting highlighted. Do you guys know that mayonnaise was invented about 1756? Well, a little while ago. Yeah, it's been pretty good. It's been a pretty good invention. But, you know, it really, it's only really meant for certain things. But it just so happens that a uh, ice cream company <laughs> over, over in, uh, I believe it was in Europe, just came out with mayonnaise ice cream. Uh, I don't know if it's getting raved reviews yet, but there are some things in life that just shouldn't happen. So I looked up some more and Squid ink ice cream, ghost pepper ice cream, lobster ice cream, you know, ketchup, so on and so forth. But there are just some things in life that just shouldn't be done. <laughs> it won't be ice cream, but we're going to see one of those things today in Daniel 5, things that just shouldn't be done. But I want to open up with, with Psalm chapter 33. I'll just read it to you, verse 10 through 12. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his hearts to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. He has been so good to us. And he'd been so good to this nation called Babylon. But unfortunately, oftentimes, the strength of mankind is so quickly fooled by its pride. So quickly led astray by its pride. Now, the first four chapters, we've been talking about Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and the kingdom that God gave him. And that he was really, arguably, my opinion, the, the most powerful man a kingdom of this world has ever produced. And he found out that it was actually God who gave it to him. It wasn't his military might or brilliance, but it was the Lord. And God spent seven years in particular humbling him and making his point clear. But we've come to a, pa a point here between chapter 4 and chapter 5 where about 23 years has gone by and this head of gold the mighty Nebuchadnezzar has passed away. He died. During this time, it seems that Daniel now kind of finds himself um, just kind of back in the shadows, no longer on the forefront, though he had been the head of all of their scholars and wise men for years and been came to known as the, the wisest person in the kingdom. So there was a series of events that happened. Um, it seems that a guy with the first name Evil, that never can be good, but Nebuchadnezzar's uh, son, he took over for almost four years before he was murdered. And then the throne was taken by, of Babylon was taken by another man, and he held it for a little while, a few years. Sorry, I actually mixed it up. The first guy, Nebuchadnezzar's son, held it for almost two years. The next one held it for almost four years. Then he was overthrown kind of by a bunch of the leaders in Babylon. And the next guy held it for about two months. Finally, along came a guy, Nebuchadnezzar. All of this you can go and, and research in, in history for yourself. And Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it is, it go, people go back and forth with who exactly his wife was. But it seems that he married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. Because um, the guy who we're going to find today, Belshazzar, not the same as Daniel's Babylonian name, but Belshazzar is a grand, grandson or a direct descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he took over the throne of Babylon after the series of changes about 555 B.C. And he ruled for a little while, a year or two, but he had a passion in life, and it was to see the world to collect things, to run all around. And so he took his son, Belshazzar, 
and he made him a co-regent, a king alongside of him, with him. And he said, boy, take care of Babylon. Take care of the city. It'll be a little more relevant as we get into the chapter of, of why I would take the time to, to mention that. And so Belshazzar really kind of watched over, sat on the throne, if you will, with, while his dad was out running the world to take care of it. And we come here where the Bible, again, highlights a moment in history, takes a moment of history and, and tells it through eyewitnesses, Daniel being, being the primary one. And the Bible here confirms secular history. Oftentimes we say secular history confirms the Bible, but I just wanted to say it in reverse, that, that you check secular history by the word of God. You see, because a number of years they thought they wrote Daniel chapter 5 off as, as not true because there was nowhere in history was this king, Belshazzar, mentioned. So therefore the Bible was wrong. But lo and behold, about 100 years ago, an archaeologist doing extensive research in the area of Babylon found, lo and behold, there was a, a king, a co-regent named Belshazzar, and he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And thus, all, all of a sudden, it became true. It was true long before history confirmed it. God's word is exactly as he said it was. And the counsel of God stands. So Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of a thousand. So the first, the thing that really brings out here is this gigantic party. This guy is going to throw a great feast. <laughs> and it's interesting because history tells us at this moment they were surrounded by their enemies. The Medo-Persian Empire, massive army, which we'll get into in some future chapters. Just this big, massive army had surrounded Babylon, Babylon the Great, the great kingdom with intention of taking it. And so he brings in and he throws this big party because he's going to show that, look, you've got nothing to worry about. We're good to go. Historians have said that the walls of Babylon were between 14 and 15 miles on each side. So that's roughly, you know, depending on if you consider it 14 or 15, um, a couple hundred square miles. To give you an example of that size, the city limits of Portland are about 156 square miles. So it had this massive wall around it, large city. The walls being 80 to 100 feet thick, you weren't going to bring your battering ram and, and knock it down. Um, it stood in some places on their towers as high as 30 stories high. Big enough, they had chariot races around the top. Historians bragged that they could shut the doors and they could survive for 20 years with their flowing river and their food reserves and what they could grow in there. No, no standing army could wait out there that long. The place was impenetrable, safe. And so he throws this party, and may, whether the lords were getting nervous or if it was just to boast in his own strength, it doesn't really say. Nevertheless, he did. The strength of man. And it was interesting, as I thought about the city and their strength, I can't think of one nation, one city that has ever been as powerful or as strong as the city of Babylon at this moment, comparatively. What place in the world could you say send the world's strongest empire against us, and we'll just shut the gates and watch you try. Never has there been a city like this that could take the most powerful army in the world and just, well, oh, nice of you guys to show up. We're going to go have a party. <laughs> this was the city of cities concerning men. And so he throws this party. I think partly also there'll be this undertone of, of past prophecies, knowledge about what was supposed to happen. See, because many people probably remember Nebuchadnezzar's proclamation that went throughout the whole world and about the dreams that both Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar had that their kingdom was going to fall. Daniel even had a specific dream, and it was interpreted about 15, 16 years before this that specifically said it would be the Medo-Persian Empire. Isaiah named, mentioned Cyrus by name. 
that he's going to take down Babylon. Perhaps some got nervous, and he's going to say, hey, guys, don't worry, man. Life's a party. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and it's not of the Father, but of the world. So he's digging into his own resources to comfort his people, give them a little lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And let's go throw a big party about it. It doesn't matter what the God of heaven thinks. It doesn't matter what he says about where the kingdom is going next. We have the mighty Babylon, and we're going to enjoy it. It's funny how oftentimes our pride is in things that, that were given to us, whether it be our natural gifts, talents, intelligent things that we've, that we've inherited, what have you. And we have such pride in things that were given to us. And what do you have that wasn't given to you? Jesus might ask. So, here he mixes some pride, puts in a little foolishness, and then adds a little alcohol. Always a bad idea. The enemy is at the gate. The enemy was at the gate, and they started to party and mix these things. The party, we're fine. The city will never fall. We're good to go. Peace and safety. But you know, anything that a person thinks up isn't interesting that someone else thinks on how to outsmart it. It doesn't matter if it's your cybersecurity or your new weapon of war or your defense system. Someone always comes up with a new way. You know, we were always so safe with our missile detection system, and now Russia's got one that can dance all around it. And pretty soon we'll invent something that can counter that, and they'll invent something that can counter that. If, you're, if your strength lies in what man has created or man has thought up, it has a time, a beginning and an end. Whether it is by God himself or through another person, it will come to an end. But here he throws his party. Let's get our mind off of it. And how many people drowned their concerns with such things? Verse 2. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold, silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple in the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now, the word father there, as many of you guys know in, in um, Aramaic here, does not always mean father-son relationship. It can mean grandfather, great-grandfather, or father. It's a word that's kind of more of a general term. We know that, uh, that he was most likely his grandson. And so we're going to find out later that he knew actually a lot about his grandfather and his interaction and encounters with God. And so that's why I, I'm kind of flavoring this a little bit with, I, I believe they had a lot of knowledge of what was supposed to go on. It had been proclaimed through Daniel, through Nebuchadnezzar, and passed down as general knowledge of what God had revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. And I think as he held the things of God, even the name of God, in fact, he sent out that proclamation that no one will speak evil about the God of Israel. That these cups and these articles, as little Belshazzar was growing up, don't touch those, boy. That's from the holy God. That's from the God of Israel. You don't mess with those. Let me tell you some stories about my encounter with him. And he would, he would tell his grandson or someone would tell him about Daniel, about what God had done. But here, flying in the face of his enemies outside of the gate, flying in the face of God saying, your kingdom has a limit, flying in the face of things that were holy to God, that were holy to his family, that had become significant. He didn't consider the past, only his moment. And he began to worship false gods with them. What a, uh, what a fool. What a fool to thumb his nose at the sovereignty of God, 
to show contempt for the things of God and to take that very same attitude and point it right towards God himself. And how quickly we oftentimes do the same thing. You know, the principle is that he should have learned through Nebuchadnezzar to honor God, <laughs> that whether it takes you through seven years out back running around like an animal, you, you will break. Your pride can be broken, and, and God should be exalted. This grandson doesn't take, it, doesn't take it to heed. And so as I thought about that and thought about really kind of the state of where we are, and this is just kind of a physical example of how we should learn from the past, the lessons we should learn from things and people that have gone before us. Now, I'm not really to the right. I'm not really to the left. I don't get too excited about conservative versus liberal or Democrat versus Republican. Um, God's right. Everybody else should be looked at through that lens. But it is interesting to me as I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about history and just some things that I've experienced in the last few years, that as God really blessed our country in the 1900s, just in a lot of ways, he really, he really blessed our country. And it came at great cost and great sacrifice. Um, and, and our country, no generation and no party, no president had it. You know, they had all their faults and their own difficulties for each generation. But there are a few things that we learned along the way. Things about valuing life, things that work and things that don't work. And I remember it wasn't that long ago, I was hiking up Multnomah Falls with my wife. And we ran into a gentleman coming down the hill and he had a, um, a Che Guevara shirt on. And uh, many of you guys, if you don't know who he was, he was a, a butcher in the revolution of, of Cuba fighting for communism. And I looked at that and we were just passing and it took me a moment to really process the fact that he was glorifying this guy. And, and I watched as, and again, this isn't necessarily a, a rail on a political system. This is just, a, just something that was interesting to me. And it was interesting as then I began to notice um, how often communism or similar principles were brought up in college or school or how it's begin to embrace these things. And it was such an interesting contrast to me, not, it was such a contrast to me because, I mean, you can take your, you can take your smartphone out and ask Google, Siri, whoever it is, and say, how many people died as a direct result of communism in the 1900s? And whether you get Wikipedia or some other source, you're going to get between 85 and 100 million people. Now, again, I'm, I'm not promoting capitalism or putting another thing down, I'm just saying, Interesting. Now that you've got a generation or two from that, oh, well, now we really know there's no downside. It's, all, you know, it's, it's good. It was just that other generation that didn't know how to do it. The things that have been given so freely, and, and again, I'm thankful um, I didn't get drafted to a war, and my, my children haven't been drafted to a war. But let us not forget from the past some things that we should learn. A hundred million people died as a result of that. And how many people sacrificed their family and time? Finding an ideology that says God is not real or dead and has no value for human life. Did we, did we learn anything from that? Did we pass it on? Did the generations now receive it? But as for my generation and after, sometimes when you're born into privilege, though many of us don't have spoon in our mouth, we silver spoon in the mouth, our mouth, we still were born into privilege, great privilege in this country. And how quickly we forget the lessons that were learned just not very much long ago. And here I believe we have a grandson in the same thing. Didn't experience the wars, didn't pour out the blood, sweat, and tears building this place just inherited it. Things had always been good. Things were always going to be good. As far as he could see in this kingdom, things were always going to be good. And I fear that we are making similar mistakes now. We're not looking what God had taught us in the past, but we are simply blindly walking into the future, thinking that things have been good and things will always be good. 
And so, again, that was just, was just an example. Um, we all have them in various forms of things in our family, our life, our finances, our partying days, or whether it was the 60s, the 70s, or whatever. We say, you know, kid, son, grandson, don't, don't do that. I've been down that road. Learn. Learn from where we've been. And don't forget but as is easy with young leaders and those who live in the present only, we forget the past quite easily. Um, there was two pastors once, and they were, they were talking about their great love for baseball. And many of you guys may have heard this before, but we'll say it again. So they were talking, man, I love baseball, man, I love baseball, on and on and on they go. And so they're like, well, let's make a deal. If one of us gets to heaven first, we'll find some way to communicate if there's baseball in heaven. Okay, deal. Done. Deal. We're going to do that. And so, you know, in the process of time, one of them passes away. And then, and then shortly thereafter, he gets, he gets his text. The, the, the pastor went to heaven, got to send one text. And so he did. Sent him a text message. And he said, oh, man, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Man, there is baseball up here, and, man, it is good. It's a great field. Just as you get in the gates, man, tell you what, it's some good baseball up here. He said, but there's bad news. You're pitching Friday. <laughs> well, our, our, our beloved young king here is about to get that kind of message. Thought things were going good, but guess what, Nevi, or guess what, Belshazzar, you're pitching on Friday. <laughs> Verse 5. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck. And he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. So in this middle of this big feast, this party with thousands of people, we are the greatest thing that ever happened, and all of a sudden they got to watch the proud king become pale. This banquet hall become a courtroom. In Exodus 8, 19, the magicians in Egypt recognize that what God was doing was the finger of God. In Exodus 31, 18, the commandments of God were written, it says, by the finger of God. And Jesus and Luke cast out demons by the finger of God. No messing around when you see this coming around. Something's going down. And everybody watched as this happened. It was probably written in Aramaic. Some argue for Hebrew, but probably. But he didn't really need a dictionary. The king needed, he needed the answer. What does this mean? And God's going to make a clear distinction here between a forgetful hearer and a doer of the word. It's, we're going to get a contrast here between Daniel and the king. But peace and safety, they were crying. With the enemies at the gates, judgment at their door. Peace and safety. I want to turn 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read just a little bit out of there. Because I really think the fall of Babylon, the first great world empire, will also give us insight on the fall of the last world empire. The one that is about to rise. We began to speak about not too long ago. We'll pick back up in a few chapters. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, concerning what's going to happen during the last great world empire. 
verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Let us be let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. These guys were crying peace and safety where judgment was at the door. But I don't think this took Daniel by surprise whatsoever. We'll get to that in a minute. He was a son of the day. He understood the times in which he was living. Belshazzar not so much, not so much. Verse 10, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall, and the queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy God, and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, spirit, knowledge understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. <laughs> Belshazzar. Why I'm having a struggle with that last couple of weeks. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. So again, the queen here is, is, would be the queen mother, probably either um, his mother, or it may even possibly been a, um, one of Nebuchadnezzar's younger wives that was still alive. But either way, she knew Daniel. Daniel had impacted her life. He wasn't just some dude that they captured and hauled off. And she even uses his Hebrew name paying him respect. And here, I mean, consider what she says about him. In whom is the spirit of the holy God. And then goes on to just really honor him and say everything that he both was and should be spoken about him. And we're going to find out that, that this king did know a little bit about Daniel. Hmm. <laughs> But Daniel, what a gift to understand the times. That no matter what life threw at him, God would give him revelation. Sometimes it took prayer and a challenge, but God would show him. And she even seems a little bit optimistic. Hey, don't worry, we've been in hard times before. There's been some strange things that have happened around this kingdom. Daniel swoops in, and sometimes it's tough, but it always works out. Let's, let's call in Daniel. You know, he helped, out, he helped out your grandpa quite a bit. He knows how to figure this out, and he is very wise. It's interesting, if you back up a couple chapters, God clearly shows that there was no one like Daniel, ten times better than all the other wise men and magicians, faithful, the Spirit of God working in his life. And this young king doesn't call him doesn't ask him, doesn't even seem to know about him. And Daniel, perhaps he was slowly set aside, perhaps he had retired. We don't really know. I always love uh, Mike's hat, says retired but not expired. So that was Daniel, we're going to see. He, though he was out of the picture, no longer in the, uh, the head council guy, it seems, but he was ready. In season or out of season, he was prepared to do the work of God. He wasn't depressed by being set aside. He known that God had given him wisdom and God was continuing to work in his life. He was still speaking to him through dreams and talking about the future, as we'll see in coming chapters. 
but he was still ready. He was still set apart for the work of God whenever God needed him. And there's a good lesson for us and a good lesson for especially maybe some of you have got a few years under your belt that perhaps God's not using you at the moment. But the amount of wisdom and what the Spirit of God has done in your life, I believe that if God still has you here, there are still things that he's going to call you in on, like Daniel. When some of us knuckleheads do something wrong. Or, yeah, I remember when that happened before. <laughs> Let me help you out, kid. But be ready. God's not done with you yet. God wasn't done with Daniel yet. Here, we find it's almost 70 years after he was taken captive, probably being in his teens when it happened. Daniel's probably in his 80s. Man, get out my cane. Come on, help you guys. It's probably not very exciting for him to do. And as you're going to see, he's not very excited. He's always ready to serve the Lord, but I don't know if he was excited to see this young king. Verse 13, Then Daniel was brought before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? I've heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretation and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Again, third ruler because he was technically the second. Couldn't give away anything above that. Daniel. Nothing, you know, it's interesting that this, this king, Belshazzar, the one whose family was so impacted by the living God and by Daniel, had nothing to say to Daniel except for what he just heard. Had never known him personally. And what a shame. What a shame it is when we have someone who has walked with the Lord that has wisdom and the Spirit of God, and we don't learn from them. And, you know, I, I say that to encourage myself or anyone else. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say younger in this room. That we have much to learn. And there are a whole lot of Daniels in this room and in the church and walking around that, that we would do well with not just knowing their name or hearing about them, but spending time with them and gleaning from what God has done in their life. This young king would have done well if he wouldn't have just heard about Daniel or maybe read, read something that he wrote, but actually spent time with him and let God minister to him. But he didn't. Here's what I know. It's just what I've heard. I've heard of you. Yep. You're the one that my grandpa captured and the one people talk about. Too bad. In Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21, Jesus talks, tells a, a story about a rich fool who had been blessed, and this particular year, a, a massive harvest came in, and the first thing he did is, man, I need bigger barns. I need more, more. And God told him that night, fool, for tonight your soul is required of you. And this was the condemnation that he had, that he was not rich towards God. And I believe this king was in the same boat. He was not rich towards God. He had spent his time living in the present being a progressive young man, ready for the future, not worried about what's happened in the past or the mistakes that past generations had made or what God did through them or with them. We got more information now. We're, we're ready to go. We, we, we know what we're doing. And he did not become rich towards God. And one of the ways that we, honestly, in my personal experience, that we become rich towards God is we learn from those who've gone before us. C.S. Lewis would say, you know, you want to you wanna grow, read old books. Spend time and learn from those who've gone before us. Because there's a, there's a saying, and it's said a few different ways, but I'll say it the way that I found it. 
If you don't learn from the past, you are condemned to relive it. We find that true. History repeats itself, however you want to say it, but it's, it's something that we must, we must learn. As the body of Christ, as children of God, we are we're called to love truth, love learning. So they're partying, living it up, pride of life. Seems that we're always full of one or the other. We're always battling that. But for Noah's day, they were living it up, partying, married, drinking, moving on, living it up, doing anything their heart desired, and then sudden destruction. Sodom, sexual immorality and great economic blessing. Peace and safety, sudden destruction. Jerusalem were so convinced in their own religious pride that they missed the Son of God and destruction came. Let us learn. They did not receive the love of the truth and exchanged it for a lie. We're going to have a generation that is also coming up that is going to do that, that's going to be walking through the the tribulation period. And though they're going to know the truth, they're going to have heard the stories, they're going to have heard the gospel, they're going to exchange it for the lie. When they see the heavens open, they're going to know that it's the day of the wrath of the, of the Lamb. There's going to be an angel that proclaims the everlasting gospel. There won't be any mistake of where the judgment comes after they cry peace and safety and sudden destruction comes upon them. We're going to hold on to that for the end. Let's uh, chat verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your reward to another. Yet I will, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up, and whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew this. And there it is. A forgetful hearer contrasted with a doer of the word of God. He knew it. He knew all of this. As will those when the Lord comes will have known what God said. The gospel is going to go and be preached. There will not be a, a tribe, nation, or a tongue that has not heard the good news of Jesus Christ before he comes. They'll have an opportunity to respond. Everybody receives some knowledge of God through their life and has an opportunity to respond. When God sends judgment, he always forewarns. He always sends a messenger because of mercy. And grace. Here, Daniel, in, in the book of James, it says, A doer of the word of God, those who hear the word of God and respond, will be blessed in all that they do. And Dan, Daniel was. He heard the word of God, and to the best of his ability, he, he lived for the Lord, and he was blessed in everything that he did. Not absent from hard times, but always blessed. And here we have a forgetful here. Ah, whatever. That's old fashioned. Good for my grandpa. This kingdom, it's going to keep on going. Things are good forever. It's going to be all right. (laughs) But interesting enough here, Daniel says, hey, king, keep your gifts. I don't want it. I only have it for a few hours. (laughs) We're going to find out that several hours later, it was all gone. Belshazzar would be dead, and the kingdom would be passed to another. Keep it all. One, I think he said to keep it all because Daniel had integrity and the gifts of God are not bought. Also, I think, Nebuch- I think 
Daniel remembered Nebuchadnezzar's dream and his own dream about a decade and a half before where God specifically says it's going to be Persia and the Medes that take this, the transition of power from that gold to the silver. Daniel knew this. He interpreted it, wrote it, spoke it. But Daniel, he was also a student of prophecy. We know from Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, that he read the book of Jeremiah and understood that, hey, 70 years are almost up. God's got to deliver his people. It's been prophesied. It's going to happen. He also, if he was reading Jeremiah, would have came across chapter 27, verse 7, where Jeremiah says, well, there's going to be Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his son's son. That's all. That seems to be all they're going to get. So three generations. And he's staring at his grandson right there. Seventy years are almost up. Also, Isaiah, a couple hundred years before, said that there would be a king who was coming to depose Babylon, and his name was Cyrus. Oh, Cyrus' armies are right outside. Uh-oh. Babylon's going to be taken over by the Medo-Persians. Daniel knew this by prophecy. There's going to be a guy named Cyrus. He knew that by Isaiah's prophecy. There was only going to be three generations, it seems, that Jeremiah indicates for by prophecy. Daniel will be reading these things. <laughs> but also, there was some more Isaiah talks about. He says not only would Cyrus come, and, and God names the, the leader of the Persian, Medo-Persian Empire by name, about 200 years prior, but he also says that he's going to enter by drying up the river and that there's going to be gates open. And we're going to find out all of this came to pass, just as God said hundreds of years before. You know, it's, uh, it's been said that we aren't looking for, you know, we're not in the time, you know, we're not uh, necessarily looking for the, the signs of the times because we are in the time of the signs. Daniel lived in days where he was watching prophecy be fulfilled right in front of his face. He was reading out of Jeremiah and Isaiah and the things that God spoke to him and gave him in dreams 10, 20 years before, and it was unfolding right in front of his eyes. We have that same scenario before us, that we too are in the times of the signs. Well, God's not going to bring this to an end. You know, has he given us something specific as naming a king or naming something? Oh, yeah, God said uh, that Israel would have to be a nation again before all these things happened. And whoa, behind, you know, 2,000 years later, oh, there it is. Israel just became a nation. He said there would have to be a one-world government. We see that unfolding before our eyes. A one-world economic system all coming together. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. We, too, are seeing them come together like Daniel and we should take that exhortation that Daniel takes as, you can have all this world. Now, God has commanded you to take care of your family and, and pay your bills and be as good a citizen as God allows. But don't get caught up in the extravagance of this world. Don't get caught up in Belshazzar's party. Everything has a beginning and an end. Our, our country, this world, this system, Babylon, all days are numbered. And let us be wise. Have a heart of wisdom. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. No time to be entangled. Verse 23. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you. And your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, many, many tekel uparsin. This is the inscription of, this is the interpretation of each word, many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck. 
and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he just lays it out there for him. You've lifted yourself up against the God of heaven in most any way that you could. Kind of a condensed version of that. And so then he goes ahead and gives them the interpretation. Many. Essentially means or can mean a couple things. A measure of money or a mina. And also can mean numbered. Tekel can mean shekel or a unit of money or it can mean weight. So basically, he's, God has checked the amount and the value, the weight, how much you've been counted and how much you've been weighed. And you're coming up light, bud. Perez. So when it says uparson there and you have Perez later, the, the letter U is essentially meant the word and, and parson is just the plural form of um, Perez. So, and that means half a shekel or divided. And interesting enough, it could also be, meant, could also be Persia. <laughs> so you've been weighed and counted, and now you're divided. It's all done. It's all done for you. All over. There is no money, authority, wealth, power that you can give to get access to the mind of God. And here we see out for us that, that as Paul says in 1 Corinthians so well, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. We have a man who rejected the Word of God, rejected the testimony of those about God, rejected the mercy of God, and stuck his, thumbed his nose at God, essentially. And nothing that he had, nothing in all the world that he possessed could change it. He was wasteful, irreverent, intoxicated, pouring his life out for the pursuit of the lust of the flesh. He was a forgetful hearer, didn't learn the lessons that God had taught from the past, didn't learn from those who had gone before him, were the most. And it's interesting to me as we search out and we, we head out towards this as a society, this, this idea of being progressive, it's interesting to me that the most progressive groups, states, are the ones with the loosest sexual laws, the loosest drug laws, where we find a rewriting of history, where an absolute focus on, on alcohol just grows. I'm sure, it's not an absolute rule, but I find that interesting. Those who are most enlightened are most focused on the flesh. Hmm. We have lots of knowledge, but we lack wisdom. We lack the fear of God. So as I, I kind of wind down on this, you know, have some, give some time for some of us who you've told and should know better to learn. You know, like a teenager, sometimes we come back 10 years later and say, man, you guys are really wise. But to the older generation, pass on those things which you have learned. Younger generation, learn those things which have been passed on. God did it through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those, the Daniels, that we might learn, we might grow. But I want to I close with a little thought from Micah 6.8. Because as I, as I look at this, why, why even tell Belshazzar at all? Why go through all of this? Why not just wipe him out? Who cares if he knows? Who cares if anybody learned from that? They were all done for. I believe it's the mercy of God. At the end of the chapter there says, Darius the Mede received the kingdom and being about 62 years old. The guy who was coming to defeat Babylon, these guys were born about the time you know, right in between Daniel and getting pulled into Babylon and the destruction of the temple. About the time that things were the worst, God was bringing about the solution and the deliverance and raising it up for that day. But I believe it's mercy, and I want to finish with Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, 
to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I believe the reason why the queen called for Daniel, why God always gives warning before he does anything, why there's a Daniel around, why the prophecies, why foretell these things, is that because while we too were sinners, Christ died for us. And, and what I really felt heavy on my heart to, to, to emphasize at the end of that was to love mercy. When we look at a Babylon, when we look at some of the things going on in our society and say, man, the writing's on the wall, they're done, I don't care. Or would we give them warning? Would we give them time? Would we talk to them? Would we share with them? Do we love mercy? Now, many of us love to receive mercy because mercy, right, is not getting what we deserve. We deserve it, but God doesn't give it to us because he's merciful. Man, we love that. But I want to encourage you today is do you love that in your spouse? Do you love that in your children? Do you love that in your neighbor? Do you love when God gives them mercy? I love it when God gives me mercy, but, but maybe my wife doesn't deserve it and I'm really irritated. Do I love mercy at that moment? Your kids are knuckleheads. Your neighbor, I can't believe they just did that. They totally deserve what they got. Or do we love mercy? God loves mercy. And here he held it out to this generation over and over until the time was done. And as we look towards the coming of the Lord, God holds out his mercy over and over. Do we love that? Do we, do we live today and say, man, God, you are so merciful. You have just poured out mercy upon those guys. You have waited, the Bible says, Till now, from the time of Christ till now. Why? Because his desire is none should perish. And he sends out his word, and he sends out his missionaries. Mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace. Man, love is mercy. May, may it make us a joyful people. May it make us a joyful people to be around that we love it when God doesn't give you what you deserve. <laughs> I love it when God doesn't give me what I deserve. So let's pray. Oh, Father, what a, what a difficult chapter, but we know that, uh, Lord, you plucked this right out of the, the pages of history and highlighted it for us, the, the fall of an empire, the humbling of a, a grandpa, Lord, and the forgetfulness of the following generations. Lord, that we might learn, that we might not forget, that we would not forget you, Lord, and the work that you've done in our families, in our country, in our lives. Lord, that you extend mercy to every generation, and it's because of your mercy that we are not consumed, and they are brand new every morning, Lord, and your mercy is brand new, held out, stretched out for everyone in this room. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful that you are a gracious and merciful Savior, long-suffering, patient, and you waited for us. That when we hated you, that when we walked away from you, Lord, you so loved us that you gave your son. We're so thankful for your mercy. So God, we just want to bless you. Lord, help us to be vessels of your mercy this week. In Jesus' name.